working with clients by myself. Now this video is going to be interesting for people who want to become psychologists and want to know what to expect from their first day, uh, particularly just their first day working one-on-one -on -one with clients as opposed to shadowing. And a few of the things that I noticed today and what I had to overcome today, some of the lessons I learned um, include how to deal with people that you don't really like, um, how to deal with people who are dishonest, how to deal with your own anxiety when you start a job, and how to deal with unrealistic client expectations. So although this is obviously going to benefit psychologists new and existing, it's also going to also hopefully be a benefit to people who are just starting a job for the first time and pretty much anyone that has to deal with other people in their line of duty, in their, in their line of work, which is essentially most of us. So I literally have just finished my very first shift and I am wiped. I'm really exhausted and that is really to be expected considering the amount of cognitive overload associated with the first day on the job. So I've obviously had those preliminary first days where you just go in and get to see how to do the job. But today it was like I was running the show. I was meeting clients um, face to face, one on one. No one was helping me. And I actually had a really full book today. So normally we usually expect to see six clients in a day of which one might be a no show. I had seven and so I had a really tiring day. So first up was just the anxiety with being a psychologist or the anxiety of being any person starting their job for the first time with your own expectations weighing heavy on you and the expectations of others, sorry, the perceived expectations of others because I can assure you nobody is monitoring you as harshly as you monitor yourself. So I found that as a lot of beginner psychologists experience, we feel that we need to say the most perfect thing in the most perfect tone at the perfect moment that will be the light bulb moment for that client, which will resonate with that client, which will just change their perspective for the better. So what I would do is literally formulate the sentence in my head, which is a common trait of high functioning anxiety people. It just wouldn't go to plan. I think I actually came across as being quite aggressive because I was like, I have to say this sentence so perfectly, exactly as, as um, I intended to. And I actually did manage to execute once. And interestingly, it just went over like the client's head. So don't think that just because you have the most perfect sentence formulated in your brain, that it's going to be effective. Actually, the most effective um, the most effective psychoeducation I was able to execute was when I was just building rapport with the client and just really in tune with them and really just on their level and really feeling what they were feeling and just repeating it back to them as well and that's what really seemed to get the best results. So I know that a lot of us will go into in corporate world, we'll go into a meeting thinking we've got to have the best sentence, we've got to have the best contribution. Don't stuff up what you're about to say. Just speak. Make mistakes. I actually did quite well when I went in with a mindset of make a mistake, say something wrong, and then build and learn from it and build rapport from there. And there was literally nothing that I said that really seemed to disrupt anyone, but there will come a time when people will just say, that was just useless. And you've just got to roll with it and you've just got to um, move on from it and keep on working towards the goals that you have with your client. Another thing that, you had, that I had to deal with today was that big ultimatum statement. And what I mean by that is when the client will say to you, and you can apply this to any job. So the client will say, my problems are A, B and C. 
how are you going to fix this for me? So th that can happen to a bank manager, a mortgage broker, a doctor, um, a lawyer. We all can get confronted with the solve all my problems right now. The clock is starting now, go. So I had the big ultimatum statement um, and I just basically said, I can't make this problem go away for you, but I can work with you to hopefully alleviate the symptoms. And honestly, the client was quite happy with that. So it's all again about managing expectations, not just them expectations of you, but my expectations of me too. And it really helps to have a great mentor. And my mentor has repeatedly said to me, do not underestimate how much you're helping just by listening. So for example, somebody that's got really terrible anxiety, just the thoughts are just circulating around and around in their heads. Just being able to say, this is what I'm going through, please hear me. And I, I'm not expecting these problems to go away just like that. But I went through this, this and this, this is what my life is like, please hear me. Being able to see that somebody cares, somebody's listening and expelling those negative thoughts helps to remove them from inside your brain. Now, another really big thing that happened today that is really big, um, and I wasn't expecting this. Like you read about it in your textbooks, but I wasn't expecting to experience this right in front of my very own eyes, is clients lying. Now just to provide some context, we think of traditional psychotherapy, um, seeing a psychologist, seeing a psychiatrist, seeing a counselor, seeing a social worker, seeing any sort of mental health practitioner, we think of the pretty much the same model, which is person has a problem, person goes to practitioner, person pays for service, and that person tells the practitioner, this is what's wrong with me. So the practitioner is coming in from the point of view that this person has a problem and they're going to tell me what it is. Now, sometimes those clients can lie, but it's usually not lying in the way that I experienced today. So they might just come in and say, I'm just having a little bit of problem at work. Um, I'm having a, a little bit of problems with my relationship or I'm having problems with my weight, whatever it might be. But then after about the third or fourth session, you get the truth of why they're coming. And it might be because they were sexually abused when they were, when they were a child. But it took them four or five sessions before they could build rapport with you, feel comfortable, or that, that um, trauma became so pressing that they finally could articulate it and get some, some therapy and honor it and, and deal with it and unpack it. So that's where the, um, I wouldn't even say they're lying, but there's a facade, there's a protection there. They're not being complete, they're not sharing with you their real reason for being there because maybe they don't even know it yet within themselves. Sometimes we actually have serious problems within our minds, like serious traumas to deal with. And we think that that trauma is buried, dealt with, not a problem. And so we're just like, you know, I should really see a psychologist for the problems I'm having at work or for a little bit of extra motivation. But the brain is actually unconsciously saying, I need to deal with this trauma. And it's not telling you it directly, but in a way it is. And then it will reveal itself in therapy work, often to both you and your conscious awareness and also within the therapeutic space. Now for me, I'm in a different situation. I will not um, provide any identifying information regarding um, where I'm working, my clients. Um, I will give, there is no way that you'll be able to um, work out specifically who or what I'm talking about, 
but what I will say is there are cases where people are actually being forced to go to um, see a mental health practitioner. An example, an example only could be maybe um, domestic violence. There's been a court ordered junction where the um, judge has ruled you need to get um, anger management sessions with a registered psychologist, for example. So in those cases, a person is being forced to see the practitioner. In some cases, the practitioner is well aware of the background. In my case, I was not for any of my clients. All I know is that I'm seeing person A at 10 o'clock. Now, I saw person A and I sort of gave my spiel of I'm um, here just to see if there's anything that you want to talk about, how are things going for you, how are you? And usually it all unravels and we start to um, find the traumas, the problems and things to sort of work on. Um, I'll just do a process of elimination, that's what I'm doing at the moment and that's um, how are you going, um, a little bit of life history that will sort of um, uncover has there been any trauma then I'll sort of say like, um, if that isn't giving me anything, if everything's still la di da, um, life is wonderful, I'll start to ask, how's your appetite? Then I'll start to ask, how are you sleeping? Then I'll specifically ask, is there anything that's bothering you? Then I'll ask about people in their lives. I'll ask about problems with those people in their lives. So I literally asked every conceivable question you could ask a person to try and find out problematic area within their life and I got nothing. So I actually left thinking that was a bit of a waste of time. I wonder why that person was referred to me. Perhaps it was an error. Now I had access to other um, practitioners case notes and I was able to go into that person's file. This wasn't a breach of anyone's confidentiality. I wasn't doing anything wrong. Now we take a, a collaborative sort of approach to mental health these days um, where people, all pr practitioners sort of work together. Everything that I do is confidential, but the information that let's say a social worker shares with me they're not bound by the same confidentiality restrictions that psychologists are. And a little bit of um, further digging, a little bit of further research on my behalf found that this person um, had a chronic substance use disorder and they had insomnia. So when I asked, how are you sleeping? Fine. It seems like that, that for some reason, they decided to um, be dishonest and, and withhold that information from me. So what I would do in that situation is I will see them again and I'll try and build rapport again. I've got a little bit of context, a little bit of their history, which I um, took note of, the pivotal relationships within their social existence. I remembered the, the key people, their names, so Hopefully, by going back in and saying, how's Joe Blow, how's um, XYZ, they'll be like, oh, they remembered what I said. So different tactics to build rapport and hopefully I'll be able to uncover and work through with this client. They're two um, significant um, mental health problems that they chose to um, hide from me. I will not give up. I will help this person. And that brings me as well to another point I wanted to talk about specific to psychology um, and then I'll talk about what to do when you don't like a person and have to work with them. But specific to taking notes, should you take notes or should you not when you're a psychologist? Now, um, I know about you guys, but when I've had to see a psychologist previously throughout my life and they were taking notes, I'm like, what are they taking notes for? And we get that a lot. Like I literally today had someone say, what are you doing with those notes? So people don't like you taking notes sometimes. Other people just 
don't really care, other people don't notice it. I work with some colleagues who don't take notes and I work with colleagues who do. So it's totally a personal preference. For me, I need to take notes. The way that I like to build rapport is to remember details. There is no way that I can remember seven people's, um, all the, the, their details of their, minute details of their lives um, from the top of my head. Sorry, I just can't. So I like to take the notes down. I try and do it discreetly. Actually, that's a lie. I will literally just um, take them down because I have to. And it's just totally up to you whether you wanna take notes or not. Now, I also today had to deal with someone that I disliked. So you know how everyone in life, you'll go to a party, you'll meet people that you just gel with, you just love them straight away, instant connection. Sometimes they're a compatible star sign if you believe in that. Other times they're just, um, they share similar characteristics with you, so you just gel with them. And then there are those people that you just do not like. Now, no one is um, above that. Um, that's the truth for doctors, that's the truth for psychologists, that's the truth for um, judges uh, that are up there handling your sentence. Some people they're gonna like more and other people they're not going to like. And that just comes down to your personality, your characteristics that you bring into the room when you enter the room it's your realm of experience, your biases, your stereotypes, your judgments that you're going to bring into any interaction with another human being. No one is exempt from that. So today I worked with somebody that I didn't like. Um, I couldn't figure out, I'm just like, why is it that I am struggling so much to build rapport with this person? And I realized that there was just something about them that I just did, didn't like at all. So as a psychologist, what we do is um, we have to do self-reflections and what that will involve is me sort of unpacking when did I start, when did I notice that I didn't like this person? Um, what were those characteristics? And I have to be really honest with myself, like I'm not immune to making harsh judgments. So for example, maybe someone comes in and they're just wearing this revolting top or something um, somebody comes in and I just can't handle the fact that maybe they used to beat their wives like there are just things that we um, that we just dislike and we still have to be professional though and we still need to honor that person's time honor that person's mental health honor that person's money as well and sometimes you just have to have a really good dialogue within your mind and be like oh that's that person saying that thing that I can't stand I can't stand it I acknowledge I cannot stand it okay now let's answer the question so you sometimes like the more you fight something the stronger that becomes that urge becomes so you just you have to practice acceptance and you have to accept that there are people that you're not going to like, and but your duty is to help them. So unpack that during personal reflections, talk to your colleagues about it, if you're able to in other professions where there isn't such a strict bond of confidentiality. And then if you know that you just can't get past this and you ethically cannot treat this person, you ethically cannot and should not be doing, extending outside of the world of psychology, you should not be doing business with that person because you're not gonna do the right thing by them as opposed to somebody that you really, really like. I hope this gives you some insight as to um, what to expect on your first day as a practicing psychologist. As for me, I am absolutely wiped. Um, seven back-to-back -back clients, and never done this before in my life in this sort of a setting. Um, as you know, I run Helping Minds online. But again, in that situation, people are coming to me with a problem and they're wanting to get support from me and they're pretty forthcoming with the reasons for being there. Today was a little bit different and it was face to face, which is different to providing online. And it was also outside of my comfort zone because I was um, in their comfort zone too. So yeah, 
great first day otherwise, very rewarding. I see a lot of ways that I can um, provide further treatment to a lot of my clients today. Specifically, I would like to brush up on pain management and some therapeutic practices to help with coping and dealing with pain management because I haven't touched on that for a little while, so I'll brush up on that after this. And thanks for tuning in and look after your mental health. It is very, very important. And I offer online support, Helping Minds Online, if you want to chat to me, get some support, instant messaging, phone calls, video, um, just the usual ways that you can talk to a person using technology. If you like my channel, subscribe, and thank you for tuning in.